know, last November, when we finally felt that the research we'd been doing for several years since the film came out had progressed to the point where it was solid enough to begin to share publicly, uh, we shared a bunch of things. And here's some of the things that we were sharing then that, that have come to pass. Uh, the BRICS Bank is now, has now been funded and is, uh, is going operational. Uh, there is a Shanghai Gold Exchange. There is a new rating service, which provides an option to Fitch and uh, Moody's and Standard and & Poor and so forth that I think is going to be uh, much more honest in its rating, um, given that it's not beholden to the Western banking cabal to do their bidding on rating particular corporations and governments, especially the U.S. and so forth. The AIIB, the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, has now been launched uh, with the participation of uh, usual U.S. allies like the U.K. and, and Germany and over 50 other countries. Um, the U.S. has chosen not to participate in the founding of that, and uh, Japan is the other, only other major uh, country that has chosen not to participate at this time, most likely because uh, the uh, Prime Minister Abe is, as far as we can tell, is very much a, a puppet for the the Rockefeller Rothschild banking system so far. So we have been told that there are uh, deals going on behind closed doors uh, there, that Japan is preparing to join, but not until it's uh, you know, safe and appropriate to do that given their their uh, obligations. So another one is that, that we had predicted based on information from our sources that there would be numerous banker uh, and corporate CEO resignations. There have been over 500 of them worldwide. Uh, and we also said that there would probably be suspicious deaths in the banking and corporate communities. Uh, and we've been seeing those. I think there's over 40 of those now in the European and U.S. banking community. Um, and there have been arrests of bankers uh, in Iceland. Uh, also, the U.S. has continued to stall the IMF 2010 reforms that would rebalance the representation of countries in the IMF in, in terms of decision making and also include more currencies like the yuan in the international basket of, of currencies. Uh, the suppression of gold and silver prices has continued artificially. Uh, and it looks from our sources, we're being told that that's apt to continue until the yuan, the Chinese currency, is globally accepted. Um, because meanwhile, they're having the opportunity to buy gold and silver at low prices, while the Western bankers are suppressing the prices in order to keep interest rates from, from going up, which would so threaten uh, the precarious situation of the major U.S. banks uh, and government themselves. Finally, I want, just want to add in, in terms of the, the validation of uh, a number of our insider sources, because some of the things that they say, we're like, what? <laughs> and then, you know, a few weeks or a few months later, uh, it happens again and again. And our sources have predicted, they predicted the end of quantitative easing by the Federal Reserve, which was pretty outrageous, uh, given that they were, Federal Reserve was still printing between 50 and $70 billion of, of uh, new fake money a month. And now they have suspended that on, on, uh, right on schedule. We're told that that's because their franchise to print money has been suspended by the Asian elders to whom they're indebted. They also predicted the revaluation of the Swiss franc, uh, and a few days later that happened. And then we were told that, that um, China would be making major infrastructure investments in Brazil. We were just told that about... Uh, Oh, a week and a half to two weeks ago. And then sure enough, a few days later, it started coming out in the, in the mainstream news that that is in, in fact going on to the tunes of, of tens of, of, of billions of dollars. So that's a sample of the things that might have sound outrageous when we said them or when people said them to us, but now uh, they are in fact occurring and it, it certainly provides pieces of the puzzle showing the trends that are emerging. So let's move on to trends next. What are the, some of the trends that we're seeing that are in the public view that have to do with global finance? Uh, first of all, um, negative interest rates. 
or what Chase Bank has taken to calling balance sheet utilization fees, or BSUS. What that really means is rather than getting interest on your deposits at the bank, now you're going to have to pay them for them to keep your money while they fractionally multiply it for their own benefit. So you can tell this is getting quite Orwellian, uh, and yet whatever they can get away with, they're obviously going to continue to do. Meanwhile, um, Citigroup, Chase, Barclays, and the Royal Bank of Scotland have been fined a total of $9 billion, which is a lot of money for their uh, participation in rigging international markets. Um, again, that's a lot of money. It's good to see that there are some fines and so forth. But if you stand back and put this in context, there are no individual prosecutions, no jail time, no companies shut down. And meanwhile, during that same time, those same banks made an estimated $85 billion dollars uh, on their actions. So, a, you know, uh, a, some wag might call this merely a cost of doing business. And of course, to the banks, that's all that it, that it seems. It's just a little slap on the wrist publicly to keep the people quiet, keep them from revolting. They, you know, they pay under 10% or around 10%, uh, basically as, as a fee to the government to let them keep rigging things. And then business goes on as usual. All of the major banks have also had to uh, comply with a government requirement to submit plans for a complete economic collapse, their own economic collapse, which of course could lead to larger economic collapses, and they've all done that. And there's good reason for them to do that because the numbers I've heard are north of $700 trillion in derivatives debt that they're current, currently holding on their their books, and obviously uh, they're not a solvent institution uh, if that were to be taken seriously. Now, speaking of derivatives, we've also started to hear around the world about bail-ins, and any, anybody who doesn't understand what's already happened in Cyprus, they seem to be gearing up for it in Greece and other countries, and the legislation is already in place in the U.S., most major countries around the world, for bail-ins, and what bail-ins means is now that people are catching on to bailouts, uh, that they're getting ripped off by bailing out the major institutions and banks, now they're moving to bail-in. And that means that the banks own your money. Not only are they gonna charge you for depositing, but when you deposit, they own your money. You become an investor in that bank. And if they declare a financial emergency, then you will get your money back if you do at the end of the line after the derivatives holders. In other words, most likely never. So the banks is no longer a very safe place to keep your money. We'll talk about alternatives to that later on. Another example of the current trends is that the, uh, the what they call the Grexit, the, the, the threat of, the, of Greece leaving the European Union, is it's got a lot of people, of course, uh, very nervous. A lot of people in Greece were excited that the new uh, Cyprus uh, regime has taken over, and they've promised to end austerity and so forth. And you know that sounds great. I I, I hate what people are being subjected to in terms of the you know cutbacks on uh, on entitlements and so forth to the degree to which people are intent uh, are dependent on that, but. Don't think that that's going to be an answer to the problem. The, the, the new government is basically a communist government that's going to simply make things even worse in the long run, as every communist government in history has over time. And in Greece, um, the, it basically the federal government is now confiscating money from the local municipalities, and that money is going to the IMF. So it's not a healthy situation. Another uh, sign is that, that so many nations are leaving the cabal banking system to whatever uh, degree they can and, and the dollar, the deals between China, Russia, Brazil, India, and so forth, where they're doing swaps for gold or actual barters in trade and so forth, doing whatever they can to, uh, to avoid the dollar, which they see as weakening and on the verge of collapse. Then we've got things like the Jade Helm um, uh, military maneuvers in 10 states in the West and, and 
Southwest, and they're, they're activating of FEMA camps and moving military equipment into uh, Walmart stores that have been shut down temporarily and so forth. Um, looking very suspicious. There's lots of reports on what this uh, may or may not be, whether it's preparation for martial law or, or indoctrinating the people to be used to military on their streets. There's no way of knowing that for sure, but it's uh, certainly not a, a, a healthy sign in these times. The, the New York Fed has also moved its offices to Chicago. I think most likely they see that as a little safer place to be in, in, in case of, of collapse. Uh, the U.S. Uh, government has declared that people claiming individual sovereignty are now the number one terrorist threat, actually the number one threat to the government ahead of terrorism. Uh, Agenda 21 is uh, moving along at an unfortunately very rapid clip to take over most of the, the property, move people into the cities and claim the resources for the government. And then China is, is in the process of reclaiming uh, the area of the South China Sea. And uh, Russia is participating in naval maneuvers in that area. And the U.S. has started to move naval ships uh, into that area. And this is really very much about controlling the shipping lane. I think we would be a little nervous if there were a lot of Russian and Chinese ships coming into the Gulf of Mexico or along the coast of, the, of California or something like that. Uh, and anyway, that, that's one way that many of the powers that be are kind of threatening to move toward a World War III that could help the Western banking powers uh, avoid a collapse, you know, establish martial law during a, a time of war and not have to answer to the, the, a lot of the problems that they've created. I don't think that that's going to happen, but it's certainly something we need to be very wary of. Okay, some other trends that are, that are playing out, um, but behind closed doors. Many people, millions of people in the U.S. and, and elsewhere around the world are, are eager to find out what's going on in terms of the global currency reset and the promised release of humanitarian funds. Well, um, I hope that you're not holding your breath for that. Um, our sources tell us that there will be a reset of global currencies, but that it won't happen until it's safe for humanitarian funds to be released. Currently, we're still under the Federal Reserve uh, system, the Federal Reserve runs SWIFT, International Money Transfer System, uh, and there's just been numerous incidences of people trying to transfer major uh, wealth around the world for humanitarian purposes and having it stalled or stolen. So there are uh, significant initiatives in preparation to mitigate that. Uh, there's a new international money transfer system that, uh, that is coming out of, of China, but really backed by the BRICS countries. And we're told publicly now that it, it's uh, set to launch in September or October, but definitely by the end of the year. And our sources are telling us that it's actually already done uh, and could be going online very soon. Uh, also, once again, the, what we've been told is that until the yuan, which has become such a strong currency now and yet not internationally really recognized and accepted all over the world, it's not part of the, the IMF uh, basket of currencies, and until it is, the uh, Chinese and the BRICS countries are not so inclined to release humanitarian uh, funds until there is a, a more universal system, uh, not under the control of the Western banking cabal. Another sign is that there's something called uh, China Union Pay. It's an alternative to Visa and MasterCard. It's created in China, but they've got branches all over the world. One of their subsidiaries is International Union Pay. And there's already 150 countries accepting it. And uh, this will allow, it's almost like a kind of an international Bitcoin on the credit card level because it will allow circumvention of the Federal Reserve System, particularly uh, in situations where the, uh, the West is trying to control other countries by sanctions such as in uh, Russia and uh, Iraq, right? I mean, and, and in yeah. Iran right now. Okay, the last one that I'll mention briefly, and then we'll go into a little more detail on it later, is the uh, impending Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. And it's 
sister in crime, the TTIP, the Transatlantic uh, Trade and Investment Partnership. Amy Goodman did a wonderful interview with Julian Assange recently. You can check that out on the Democracy Now! website. Um, and Julian was talking about the TPP. The, the uh, WikiLeaks uh, had released four chapters of this agreement. Uh, and they're in the process of releasing another uh, 19, I think, something like that. Um, I mean, this is an agreement that started being negotiated in uh, 2005 as the Trans-Pacific Strategic Economic Partnership Agreement. So here we are 10 years later, and uh, the only people that have seen this agreement in the public are a few Congress people in the U.S., uh, who are only allowed to go into a room with no notes. Uh, they're allowed to look at the agreement, and then they're sworn to secrecy. They can't talk about it. They can't write it down. So what the heck <laughs> would require that sort of behavior when the Congress people are supposed to be working for us and this trade agreement is supposed to be uh, benefiting us? Well, it's obviously um, not that. It's the same as the New World Order. It's the same as the Agenda 21. It's the same as all of these major countries uh, actually operating as uh, corporations behind the scenes. It's a global takeover, but the powers that be learned you know, years ago that if you try to invade when, uh, people when you're outnumbered with, uh, through uh, through might of arms, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to have a lot of blowback. But if you can fool them into submission uh, economically and through lying in the media, then before they know it, you know, you, you've actually got them where, where you want them. And Julian Assange, to boil it down in his interview, basically what he said is, is that the TPP deal isn't about trade. It's about corporate control. The TPP is really one of the kind of artworks of the Trilateral Commission, which was created by uh, David Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski, and is one of the, the kind of three major uh, publicly known but uh, secret societies that is has been planning the New World Order and, and operating toward it for quite a while. Let me give you a quote from Zbigniew Brzezinski, who is actually uh, Obama's main foreign policy advisor when he also first came into office. I think he was Secretary of Defense under Carter, but he's been a Rothschild Kissinger operative uh, since day one. Uh, he said in 1969, he said, the nation state as a fundamental unit of man's organized life has ceased to be the principal creative force. International banks and multinational corporations are acting and planning in terms that are far in advance of the political concepts of the nation state. So if those of you who remember the boardroom scene from the movie Network where the, where the, uh, the guy who was doing uh, the kind of whistleblowing on the, on the TV was basically they closed the curtains and gave him a download on how the, the world really works. You know, look that up if you haven't seen it. But it's basically making this same point that those, the, the people who really want to control everybody in the world, they laugh behind closed doors at the notion of nation states because they know that nation states uh, are controlled by a very few in the government, but those few in the government are controlled by the bankers and the, uh, and the international uh, corporations as we laid out in the, the follow the money pyramid. So if you understand that, then you realize that the TPP is simply using the cover of government the government is basically the enforcement arm. It's the media arm and the, the enforcement arm of the international bankers operating through the corporations in consolidating the resources of the world. So if you have any doubt about uh, what Brzezinski is saying, um, here's another quote from David Rockefeller himself from 2003 from his memoirs. He said, some even believe we're part of a secret cabal, working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists, and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure, one world, if you will. 
If that is the charge, I stand guilty, and I am proud of it. So that's clear. It's very clear that these people are operating from, from the corporate point of view to consolidate their interests uh, and to create a, basically a one-world corporation with them in charge. Now, uh, I am not a big fan of government, as you all know. I'm not in favor of some people having rights that other people don't have and then using that to take others' money and go off and wage wars and kidnap their kids to fight in them and, uh, and you know, all of the crony capitalism and subsidies and all the stuff that we've talked about uh, for years. However, when corporations, which are simply businesses that are sanctioned by and controlled by uh, the governments, when those two go into, into collusion – the governments and the corporations, that's fascism. And that's really what we're talking about here. If we had international businesses which were accountable for their behavior, they were the individuals were accountable, and they had to be transparent in terms of their, their transactions, um, and they weren't protected or subsidized by the, corporate, by the, uh, the government, uh, then things like this fast-tracking of the TPP and TP. IP behind closed doors, it could never work. You know, the citizens would not allow it. And when it came out that the corporations were uh, going to transcend national sovereignty in order to be able to sue nations, aka taxpayers paying their hard earned money in to pay off the fines because corporations are suing the nations for doing things like trying to protect workers and trying to protect the environment, all those, those, uh, bothersome little things that get in the way of corporate profits that the TPP will authorize countries to sue, I mean corporations, to successfully sue the government for, and that you and I will need to pay uh, for, and to sue them in international courts set up by and working for the corporations themselves. So it, it really is basically a global test of our awareness. You know, how much do we understand? How much are we willing to put up with? Because if people don't understand this and are willing to put up with it, we'll very quickly find ourselves in an international uh, corporation with NATO as its enforcement arm uh, and all of us beholden to the, the international bankers. And that will all be you know, legal and we'll be paying taxes for it to the, to the World Bank. Okay, one final quote, just to, to bring this point home because it's so important now. Uh, this is from Henry Kissinger in 1991. And this has to do with things like uh, Jade Helm and uh, the FEMA camps and uh, the, you know, this, the, the Patriot Act, which is now being replaced by the USA Freedom Act. But if you read it closely, it's just, you know, the wolf has put on a different sheep's clothing and, and so forth. Uh, Kissinger said, today, America would be outraged if UN troops entered Los Angeles to restore order. Tomorrow, they will be grateful. This is especially true if they were told that there were an outside threat from beyond, whether real or promulgated, that threatened their very existence. It is then that all peoples of the world will plead to deliver them from this evil. The one thing every man fears is the unknown. When presented with this scenario, individual rights will be willingly relinquished for the guarantee of their well-being granted to them by the world government. Henry Kissinger in 1991. So th those three quotes kind of tell you the agenda of the New World Order pretty clearly. Okay, let's move on to what's likely now. So we follow, as we said in our, our last blog, we, we put up a list of over 70 different sources that we follow pretty closely. And a lot of the, uh, the economic uh, pundits that I respect the most are almost in unison now uh, predicting an even greater economic collapse coming in potentially this fall. And this, this includes Peter Schiff, uh, Gerald Salente, Max Kaiser, Tyler, Tyler Durden of Zero Hedge, uh, Jim Rickards, uh, Jim Willey, Ron Paul, Martin Armstrong, and even Catherine Austin Fitz, who has uh, you know, been a close colleague of ours. And has not really talked much about collapse. She's been much more speaking in terms of a slow burn. Uh, she was on a radio program recently uh, talking about how a major turning point could be coming this fall. 
And I want to cite a few of uh, some of her data because I think it's really useful in assessing the situation for the rest of it. What she's really talking about is, uh, is the whole debt dynamic that most people don't really sufficiently understand. She pointed out that 39 countries have a greater uh, than 100% debt to GDP ratio. In other words, they're broke. Uh, and the USA is one of them with a 230% debt to, um, to gross domestic product ratio. What she's worried about is the level of violence going up in response to this. And I think that could be a lot of what Jade Helm is about, is just preparing for that kind of uh, violence in response to the collapse. She's predicting that the, the bull market in bonds is going to end. It could plateau or it could actually fall. The big banks, she's pointing out, has, have, uh, have shifted the sovereign um, – they've been shifting their debt into the sovereign governments who are already in financial collapse. So the banks now have all these, these huge revenues. They were bailed out by the people you know, on behalf of the governments, which are – in, in the process of collapsing. What she's more worried about is perpetual entrapment than collapse. She says they can harvest our future for a while and make money on it. Now, she calls it the, the financial coup d'etat, where equity is going into private hands and liabilities are being laid on the backs of nations, which is just a, a code word for taxpayers. So she's saying that a major turning point looks like it's coming this fall, that SDRs, the special drawing rights, um, from, which is the, basically the new international currency uh, from the IMF, uh, the SDRs seem to be coming to a head. And when posed the question, are we headed toward collapse or war, she said, well, it could be either of those, but there is also change. And she said she sees the change coming on a decentralized basis. And uh, so do we. Uh, let's talk for uh, a moment about what can we do about these types of situations. We highly recommend that you do whatever you can to empower local economies and local systemic communities. Not just that you can say hi to your neighbor, but that if you've got some, uh, some awake neighbors, if they're not, you wake them up. If, if they are awake already, just you know, have, have a gathering where you talk about the possibility of tribulations in the U.S. or whatever country you're in. And just get to know each other and share phone numbers and kind of get a sense of uh, how you would as a community handle breakdowns in communication or food availability or – uh, water. You know, we've been doing this in our local community here, and it's very exciting, actually, to see what kind of a, a liberating and empowering bond it creates, and how many people, you know, have uh, individual wells, or they've been for storing food, or they're growing food, or have access to others who are. Anyway, it's just a relief as you start to take action. The next one we recommend is educate. Just do everything you can with whatever time you have to write about these things, speak about these things, uh, and to, to help others wake up and speak up also. Because education is the key thing. Once people have enough information, then they can, uh, they've got the creativity and initiative to take whatever actions they can, whether it's protesting or petitions or speaking to their politicians, none of which are my favorites, but they all play a part in this you know, messy process of you know, reform and transformation of our systems. And most especially, we recommend build alternative systems. As these old systems are crumbling, which they are, the financial system, the media system, um, the educational system, the infrastructures, they're all crumbling. The evidence is clear now. But everywhere we go, we see people who are creating alternative currencies, alternative schools, alternative financial mechanisms, uh, alternative media, uh, new ways to access energy, uh, to alternative health approaches, uh, other ways of communicating and, and creating uh, either local or uh, independent eco-communities. So 
throughout history, when regimes have failed, and they've never failed on this global scale before, but when they've failed, they've always been replaced by the next authoritarian regime. So to the degree to which we've got viable alternatives on the table, growing already and in communication with each other. And that's what the Thrive Movement is about. It's what the New Earth Nation and the Resonance Project and the, the Shift Project and uh, you know, so many, many, many movements and projects around the world are, are creating these alternatives. And more and more we're linking together, even if we don't agree on everything, we're linking together in support in creating alternative uh, healthy lifestyles that everybody can access.